As a lawyer, I have devoted maybe three decades to litigating what we call mass torts, which are patterns of wrongful conduct that injure and harm people out in society that aren't punishable as crimes, um, but can be, become the subject of a civil lawsuit for money damages to compensate for the harm. Um, and what has always fascinated me is how quick we are to say, well, if there's a defective product, um, well, that's obviously that's a mass tort and that company, whether they're making, you know, pharmaceuticals like, you know, Oxycontin or some other uh, pharmaceutical or product that's been shown to harm people, uh, maybe even a defective motor vehicle, um, that that company should pay. It should pay for the harm that it caused. But when it comes to all of the traffic violence in our streets, particularly in our urban streets, which are so full of vulnerable road users, people never look at it as a mass tort. And in this chapter of my legal career, I've been focusing on trying to bring that mass tort analysis to bear on the everyday interactions of people in our urban environment. Um, and, and so as a bike lawyer, what I do is I try to look for the patterns. Um, and what I see in those patterns is a level of carelessness uh, on the part primarily of drivers, I have to say, uh, not being aware of how harmful their conduct is, not really being cognizant of how they are bulls in a china shop, so to speak, as they move their ever larger SUVs, pickup trucks, and other vehicles around in an environment full of people who are not in cages, who are not armored, who are not seat belted in, but just walking around or perhaps riding a bicycle, a skateboard or something else that leaves them vulnerable to severe harm if they're struck by a motorist. And, you know, the motorists think, well, driving, everyone drives, people drive all the time. You know, you drive all the time, your mentality is that of a driver and so, you, you don't recognize the grievous harm that can result just from a moment's inattention in an environment like New York City where I practice. Um, and one of the clearest examples of this is how drivers seem to have bought into this idea that whatever amount of insurance they purchased, that that should be the extent of their liability if they harm someone. Well, New York has some of the highest minimum insurance requirements in the country. We require a private driver to have at least 25,000 of insurance uh, to protect against the harm caused uh, resulting in injury, or 50,000 uh, if you fatally injure someone. So um, those are actually high numbers, but, but think about it. No one would trade the loss of a limb for 25,000 or the loss of a family member for 50,000. But drivers seem to think when they cause those kinds of losses or lesser losses that still are life-changing, like a seriously displaced fracture that requires you to get metal hardware put in your arm, that reduces your range of motion, that may completely end your career as a, someone who wants to be an athlete or a musician or an artist, uh, or, or just whatever it is that you love doing, if your injury prevents you from doing that, you feel like you've lost the thing that matters most to you. Uh, or if you lose a family member, which is a whole other level and dimension of loss, to lose a person you care about and love. Imagine trading that for $50,000, or trading that injury that changed your life and took away the thing you love for $25,000. No one would ever do that. You know, those sorts of injuries and, and fatal crashes cause for harm that's so much greater. Why on earth should the amount of insurance you decided to purchase be the cap on your liability and responsibility for the harm that you caused? You know, just because that's how much you bought. And now let's put it into context. Big surprise, the people who are the worst drivers have bad driving records, have higher insurance rates, and you know are the last ones who are going to buy extra insurance. <laughs> the worst drivers have the minimum coverage, and they're the ones causing the most harm. And the, the idea that 
you know, they would be, you know, able to just cap their liability. Look, you got the insurance, leave me alone. That's our system, right? As if everyone got together and decided, yeah, we like cars as a way to get around. Let's have a situation in which, except for some minimum level of insurance, whoever gets hurt by our motoring system is just, it's on them. They have to live with the loss of their family member or the loss of limb or the loss of the pursuit they love because them's the brakes. We're not going to put it on the negligent or reckless driver because that would make driving so expensive that we won't be able to drive so much. This is the fictitious social compact that these drivers seem to believe was struck by us. Well, let me tell you something. People who live in New York City who don't get around by car everywhere or other cities like it never made that deal with you. We didn't agree that we would absorb all the losses caused by your negligent and reckless motoring without forcing you to buy insurance in a sufficient amount to redress all of that harm. We're just here. You drive into the city and you hit us and you say, well, there's the insurance. That's it. Right? No. There is a movement against traffic violence and to hold drivers accountable. And at the heart of it is to say, whatever harm you cause on your fellow human being, you're going to have to answer for that harm. Does it happen in every case? No, it doesn't happen in nearly enough cases, you know, but it, can we make it happen in more cases? Can we lift the minimum amount that you have to have of insurance coverage so that more of this harm is covered? Absolutely, we can and we should. Can we have driver accountability so that drivers have to actually pay something more than their insurance premium when they cause harm that outstrips their insurance? We, as members of the plaintiff's personal injury bar, can do that and should do that and should take defendants to trial more often to make sure that they experience real accountability and something that at least approaches, gives them some concept of the amount of harm that they've caused so that people someday will finally realize how dangerous it is to drive. Not so that they never drive, not so that there's no cars and no driving, but so that they realize how important their decisions behind the wheel are. They get off the phone, they stop being distracted, stop driving aggressively, and understand what that means to that person they might hit. That's the mission that I've devoted my law practice to, and many other lawyers have as well, a growing number lawyers and clients in a movement to make our streets safer, to make the public realm more secure and inviting, and to promote our civic culture, our bike culture, our local culture in spaces that are far too given over to private aggressive motoring by drivers who aren't held accountable for the harm, physical harm, and other burdens that they impose on everyone else starting with exhaust, ending with traffic deaths, and everything in between. So that's why insurance is, is not the alpha and omega of a personal injury practice. It's just the beginning if we really want to do justice for our clients. That's what I believe, and that's what I try to win for my clients.